Uh, so look, I don't want to have one of these talks where I just drone on for you know, some very long period of time and then there's a question period afterwards, so please feel free to ask questions you know, during, the, during the talk. However, if the question seems to me to be one that's going to involve a long, detailed kind of thing, I will suggest putting it off till the end. So I normally talk for an hour, but I guess an hour is really more or less the time of the whole thing here, so I'll have to cut stuff out. Maybe it will be easier to do as I move along. Um, okay, so let me start with the so-called hard problem of consciousness, and that uh, is the problem of why the brain basis of a given experience is the brain basis of that experience as opposed to another experience or none. Here's an example. So um, this is uh, a brain. The all the arrows are pointing to the back of the brain where the early visual cortex is. Um, so there's this area, MT, and maybe some surrounding areas like MST, that are known to be the basis of our experience of a certain kind of motion of uh, optic flow. Um, if you knock that out, people have uh, what's called akinetopsia, where they don't see motion. Um, and then that thing gets activated whenever people see, um, uh, when people do see motion, even if it's after images of motion, like the waterfall illusion. Um, okay, so we know that is at least a large part of our of the neural basis of our experience of motion. But why is it the neural basis of that experience of motion rather than, say, the experience of a face or something else entirely? Okay, so nobody. It's not just that nobody has a clue how to answer that. It's nobody has even come up with a hypothetical uh, answer to it that is it at all is at all satisfactory. That's why it's the hard problem, and that's distinguished from uh, the easy problems. These are my uh, terms uh, uh, produced by my colleague David Chalmers, um, and the easy problems are problems about the function of conscious experience. Um, how it interacts with uh, sensory inputs, with other mental states like beliefs or thoughts, and how it affects um, um, uh, 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 behavioral outputs. Um, so those are the so-called easy problems. Now, um, a common distinction made um, is uh, between phenomenal consciousness, that's what the hard problem is about, um, what it's like to smell a rose, see the sky, feel a pain, and access consciousness, which is perhaps can be defined as global availability of the information in an experience. Um, so access consciousness is the domain of the easy problems. Phenomenal consciousness is the domain of the um, hard problem. Now, there is, um, it is commonly felt, and I, I think that that's pro uh, that, that the feeling I'm talking about is probably present uh, um, in this room among um, people who have a kind of engineering way of looking at things um, that there really isn't any serious difference between the phenomenal consciousness and access consciousness. Maybe no difference at all. Maybe all phenomenal consciousness could ever come to is access consciousness. Or another thought that is related to that is uh, maybe, maybe there's a difference in some conceptual way, but it's not something we could ever find out about because all you know about anything is how it functions, how it affects other things. And we've already said that's the domain of access consciousness. So how could we ever find out about this stuff? Um, I used to teach, I taught at MIT for 25 years, and I found that that point of view was, uh, was very common among my, among my students. Actually, you know, it's better for me to do it from here. Just a second. Um, Okay, so um, what I, I'm going to argue, well, I'm not really going to argue this, but I, I will be saying that uh, phenomenal consciousness seems to be better approached through biological approaches rather than computer approaches. Uh, computational approaches are, are better fitted to access consciousness. Um, I'm not going to argue about that explicitly, but what I am going to talk about is how we know these things are different. And I'll give you some actual evidence that they are different and say a little bit about how they're different. 
Um, so the issue I'm going to be talking about is our conscious perception and cognitive access to perception, that is access consciousness, fundamentally different. Uh, the talk's going to have three parts. I'll talk about a controversy about sparse versus rich perception, about concepts, and then I'll, I'll, I'll end with these methodological breakthroughs that I think uh, have something to uh, say about how to approach the issue experimentally. And I should say, by the way, that the experimental approach to this subject really is only about 20 years old. Before that, you know, consciousness research was uh, not a serious thing. It was regarded as a um, a tenure killer among scientists. That is, if you study it, forget tenure. Um, OK, so um, sparse versus rich first. So there is a debate uh, between um, uh, the view that uh, conscious perception is sparse and that conscious perception is rich. I myself think that the resolution of the debate um, is that it's cognition that's actually sparse, that's thought, reasoning, problem solving. Um, and that actual conscious perception is rich. And that shows that conscious perception must be, at least in part, distinct from cognition. What suggests that conscious perception is rich? Here is an experimental paradigm um, um, due to George Sperling. Uh, so first you have, I guess I can use this thing. Can you see that pointer? OK, so you, first you have an array of alphanumeric, yeah? Can you uh, just quickly talk about what the difference between sparse and rich in your terminology is? Because there's like yeah. the machine learning version of it, which a lot of people oh. here are probably familiar okay. with. OK. That's probably yeah. different. I'm sure it's different. Uh, you will see that um, it's going to be defined, in fact, by um, some experiments I'm going to show you. But the idea is that cognition um, for certain kinds of materials only holds about four items. Um, that is, it's really what's called working memory. If you want to, uh, if you're interested in how people think, there is a mental scratch pad known as working memory. If you want to, for example, go from P and if P then Q to Q, you've got to store P and if P then Q in your working memory. Um, and that holds about four items. Now, it's, there's a controversy about what exactly an item is, and there are many controversies about it, but that's the basic idea. And it's common to not only um, 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 uh, mammals, but also uh, birds, lizards. And there's even some evidence that this is rough. Something like this is the limit even in insects. So it is a ubiquitous feature of, um, um, of you know, um, information processing in animals. Uh, however, the number, so that's sparse, OK? Rich is what's in phenomenal consciousness. Um, so that holds many more things. And that's what I'm going to argue. So it's a way of getting at the fact that they are different. OK, so here is the idea of, the, of this experiment. You show people a, a, an array for a very brief time. Um, uh, and then after the array has gone off, you ask them uh, what they saw. People can report that they saw an array of alphanumeric characters. Um, but if you ask them for specific characters, they can usually report three or four. Okay, So there's the limit of three or four. Um, so this guy, George Sperling, who was uh, uh, in his PhD thesis at NYU, uh, um, tried to explore the idea that people felt that they saw all or almost all of those items. And that's, you know. It's easy to be a subject in this. You can do it yourself. And you'll have that sense that you saw all or almost all. Um, so what he did was, how many know about this? I'm just curious. OK, no one here has ever taken an intro psych course, is my guess. Um, OK, so here's what he did. He, in this blank period, before you have to answer, he used a high tone for the top row a medium tone for the middle row, and a low tone for the bottom row. And what he found was they could report three or four from any given row, even though they could also report only three or four if not given a cue. And this is called partial report superiority. And the idea is 
that your phenomenal awareness ha uh, has a capacity of three times three and a half, whereas you can only report three or four, OK? So that is an index of richness. And here's this Sperling um, um, saying um, uh, that people insist that they've seen more than they can report afterwards. OK, so that's the kind of thing that suggests rich. What about what suggests sparse? So here's a, 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 a undoubtedly everybody has seen one of these things. You have a picture, a blank, uh, another picture that's different from the first one, a blank, and then you start over. Uh, this is a paradigm developed by these guys, O'Regan, Rensink, and Simons. And here's an example. How many see what's changing? OK, I am going to show you what's changing, and I, I hope you'll be surprised. There it is, see? OK, uh, how many are surprised? Why are you surprised? You're surprised because it's a big change. Sort of right, you know, it's not exactly in the middle, but it's a kind of, it's a big change. You feel like you saw the whole thing, but if you did see the whole thing, why didn't you see the difference? Um, I'll show you a couple more here. Uh, here's another one. How many see what's changing? Oh, it's a little easier this time. Uh, okay. How, how many? I mean, it's just how many don't see what's changing? Okay, good. Okay, I'm going to move this pointer to it. There it is. There. Okay. I'll do one more just because they're fun. <laughs> OK, what's changing is this, the, ooh, not doing very well here. Something's the matter with it. Uh, I'm sorry, something's wrong with that. OK, so here is a very pathetic one that I'm going to use just for, you'll see why. Uh, so this one is very, so this was originally made for a PC. I'm using it on a Mac. And I, you know, I'm not skilled enough to get it to go faster. But something is actually changing. How many see what's changing? OK, I'll tell you what it is. It's the bar in the back. See? OK, the reason I'm using that is because I happen to have an eye tracker trace of it. And this gives you a little uh, recipe for making these things. So the trace uh, only involves one hit on the bar. Um, and that is an index of the fact that people are not by and large, not attending to the bar. And that tells you what you can change in these pictures. Um, and this is a culture relative thing. It's, uh, different cultures will attend and different genders will attend to different things. Um, but if you change something that people tend not to attend to, then people will not notice the difference. And that is one of many items of evidence that this is an attentional phenomenon. But there are two different accounts of what kind of an attentional phenomenon is. One account is this inattentional blindness account, which is you don't consciously see the features that change. That's the sparse view. The other view is the inattentional inaccessibility um, um, or in a, it, sorry, lack of access, not inaccessibility, lack of actual access. You do see the features that change, but you don't conceptualize them at a level that would allow you to notice the change. And that difference is going to figure in this whole talk. The difference between not actually seeing it, on the one hand, the sparse view, and on the other hand, the rich view, you see it, but you don't conceptualize it at a level. And here's a little diagram of the difference between the two views that I'm going to be contrasting. So this is the top one is my view, that you have rich conscious perception, there's an attentional bottleneck, and then you have sparse cognition. My opponent's view, because they have to explain partial report superiority just as I do, their view is that the bottleneck is between unconscious perception and conscious perception. Conscious perception is sparse, and cognition is sparse. So I'm now going to show you a few 
pieces of anecdotal evidence for my view, okay? Yeah? Just quickly, how would you describe the difference between conscious and unconscious perception? Yeah. Is it, is it an awareness to the, the information, or is it more than that? Well, remember I started with the um, idea of phenomenal consciousness, what it's like to smell a rose, you know, to hear a, a, you know, a, 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 a musical note. In conscious perception, you're having that, and in unconscious perception, you're not having it. So it's a commonly noted uh, thing in the literature on consciousness that no one has a definition of phenomenal consciousness. It's something you can only point to by using phrases like my colleague Thomas Nagel's phrase, what it's like to exper experience you know, the redness of red or um, and of course, this, not surprisingly, has given rise to the idea that when people set, talk this way, they don't know what they're talking about. And that there isn't any really any difference between accessing information and having an experience of the redness of red. Furthermore, a lot of people feel, maybe there is such a thing, but I don't like it. So I've encountered that. You know, I've gone around giving talks on this for some time. I've encountered a lot, and I'm sure there are probably people in this room, maybe half the people in this room, who don't like phenomenal consciousness. Why would anybody pay any attention to that? Um, but I'll tell you, I think that it is unwise for people, in, certainly in my business, but also in yours, to ignore such a salient feature of our mental lives, because it may turn out to be really crucial to things you actually do care about. So I think, I think people really should keep an open mind about there being phenomenal consciousness, what its role is, and people should not adopt the view that a lot of people do, which is that we can approach issues, for example, in artificial intelligence, just ignoring this. Because if it turns out that um, a lot of our important mental processes are done via um, um, uh, phenomenal consciousness, then it may be that we, if we're trying to make machine, you know, machines do significant cognitive things, that we're going to have to in some way give them that or some substitute for it that does the same job or something. But we better know about it before we figure out figure that we don't have to pay any attention, yeah? And when you're now describing consciousness, you are kind of omitting like the role of memory. Yeah. And I was hearing, for example, like Michael Graciano, he sits a lot about this is information processing and memory is like a key. Oh, please use the microphone. All right, yeah, yeah I, I was still wondering uh, what about memory. Yeah. That's, that's kind of something that is. Okay, I think you can have consciousness without memory. The reason I'm talking about memory is because it's involved in a lot of experiments. So, I think it is possible to think about consciousness in the absence of, without thinking about memory at all. But um, you know, you have to have some experimental approach to consciousness to be thinking about it in a, an objective way. So memory turns out to be really important. And I'm really contrasting two kinds of memory, what is sometimes called iconic memory that has some kind of phenomenology to it. Um, and working memory, which is a, the, the, our cognitive workspace. So, uh, but uh, that's not because I think memory is um, crucial to consciousness. It's because it's a it's a way of getting x a way of approaching the subject that where we know something about how to do experiments on. So here is so I'm gonna so just to remind you what's about to happen. I'm gonna show you two phenomena that I think give a kind of anecdotal support for my view, OK? So here is the first one. How many have seen this? Anybody seen this? OK. This is a slow change. Uh, so what you are looking at on the screen is changing right now. And your job is to try to figure out what is changing. Don't say. But, 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 okay, just, let's just look at it, okay? F try to figure out what's changing. Don't say what's changing if you know. Is this a question about this? I was about to say it's not changing. Oh, no, don't say that. How many saw what was changing? 
OK, I'm now going to show you, and I think most of you will be surprised. OK, I'm just going to click on this thing here. See it? Did everybody see? OK, so here's the thing. OK, so here is the intuitive force of this. I think this argues strongly from my side. Why do I think that? Because look at that base. It's a huge part of the picture. You were staring at that thing, looking around, moving your eyes around. You know, it was on the screen for almost a minute, I think. Um, you must have looked at that thing a few times. But here's the thing. Why didn't you notice the change? It's because you didn't conceptualize the color. You didn't say to yourself, at the beginning, red, and at the end, purple. You didn't say the words red or purple. If you had conceptualized them, applied your cognition to it, then you would have been able to notice it. But it's hard to notice something that you don't conceptualize. So I think that this suggests that, OK, so there's this thing I haven't introduced, the global workspace. So I'll, I'll mention that in a minute. Um, but um, uh, the global workspace is an opposed theory of consciousness, uh, opposed to mine. Um, and uh, I think um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll explain this in a minute. But I think why I think the um, uh, uh, the reason that something isn't um, uh, broadcast in the global workspace is it's not conceptualized. Now I'm going to show you another one. How many have seen this? Oh, good. Um, this is well. I'm not even going to tell you what it is, but just watch and listen to the sound here. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. But I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lydia Smythe. But, but, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. OK, so now what you're going to see, you're going to see the whole thing sh over again from a different camera that shows you more. <laughs> Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts <laughs> at precisely the time that this dastardly thing took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's stones the most dead. But I was in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. OK, so here, this, by the way, this, this is a BBC um, uh, uh, bicycle safety ad. And uh, it's this kind of work that, uh, uh, for example, uh, made people realize that it's really a bad idea to talk on a cell phone while driving. Um, and there's a lot of experimental work that backs that idea up. And the reason is, this is an, an attentional problem. Now, my opponents like to think of this as inattentional blindness. But I think this case argues for my view, which is inattentional lack of access to the difference. So, and my reason for thinking that is, I mean, look, for example, at the, at the guy who's speaking. You looked right at him. It really, uh, uh, you really must have registered his coat, for example. It was one color at the beginning, another color at the end, and likewise for many other things. So why didn't you notice the difference? Well, I think you didn't notice the difference because you didn't conceptualize that color. So con noticing is a lot easier if you conceptualize. Now, I keep using this word concept. Now. I feel like I've used up about half of my time, and I'm really nowhere near done. Uh, so this is over at like roughly two. Is that the idea? OK. 
Well, okay, so look, I'll have to kind of skip around. By the way, if you raise your hand and I don't see you, it's because the lights are kind of in my eyes, so you might just wave your hand. Um, so, um, okay, so, um, well, maybe I should start skipping around now. Uh, well, let me just mention one other experiment. So this is a, uh, this is a sort of, of Sperling-like experiment uh, uh, done by a group in Amsterdam. Um, and um, the idea is that you have, at the start, you have a, 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 a circle of rectangles, eight rectangles. And then there's a blank period. And then if there's if another circle of rectangles. And uh, at some point, there's a pointer that points at a rectangle. And the job of the subject in the experiment is to say whether the new, whether the, the rectangle pointed to is a different orientation from the first one. Everybody get that? OK, so the answer in all these is yes. The pointer can come at the end, or it can come at the beginning, or it can come in the middle. If it comes um, uh, at the beginning, people can get almost all eight. If it comes at the end, they can get four. And the idea here is that's the capacity of working memory, which we talked about before. The new um, uh, array at the end uh, wipes out your, your, your uh, uh, phenomenal memory of the, of the array. Um, the interesting one is in the middle. And here you can get somewhere between seven and eight. So the, the, the four at the end is an index of your cognitive access or, or access consciousness capacity. The one in the middle is an, uh, uh, an index of your the, your phenomenal memory. So it's these two kinds of memory that are at issue here. Now, of course, my opponents think, oh, how do we know that that memory is a conscious memory? Maybe these things are actually unconscious. And so, um, and then when you get the cue, there's something is summoned up from, from unconsciousness. Um, so what is clear, though, is that more items can be held in the um, um, non-conceptual. So I, what I think is that, these, that this memory is, a, and what's really crucial to these experiments, it's a non-conceptual memory. Now, I think that these non-conceptual uh, uh, representations are, are conscious, but uh, I'll have to wait to get to the evidence for that. So just to remind you, here are the, uh, um, are the two views. And the, uh, put in terms of whether uh, um, uh, attention um, uh, it promotes conceptualization, as I think, or whether it um, is needed for consciousness. And I should say, by the way, I'm, uh, uh, which probably people something probably people here aren't aware of is which is that um, in recent years philosophers have become very tied in with a lot of discussions in um, uh, uh, psychology, neuroscience, AI. Um, and so uh, these people are, you know, the, the, the disagreements here are e equally split between uh, uh, philosophers and scientists. Now, I've been using this word uh, concept. The word concept is actually ambiguous between um, a sense in which um, it means something that can be shared among many people, something kind of abstract that's at the top, something meaning-like, or this mental representation sense that was used uh, by, the, for example, the British empiricists. So I'm going with the mental representation sense. It's just uh, I'm just telling you about terminology. Now, this notion of a concept is um, often um, uh, puzzles people. There's a famous case that helps to uh, illustrate what are um, uh, on the notion of a concept. There's this uh, uh, French philosopher named Bruno Latour who says said that um, Ramses II could not have died of tuberculosis because it wasn't discovered then. And this is an actual quote. Before Koch, the bacillus had no real existence. To say that Ramsey II died of tuberculosis is as absurd as saying that he died of machine gun fire. Um, and so I quote this partly because it's kind of funny. Um, uh, but the idea here is that um, it's the, he's confusing the concept, in my sense, with what it's a concept of. And so that helps to illustrate the idea. Oh, some of my. Things aren't displaying properly, but what, what can I do? So, what I think is that the um, that the that conscious experience is non-conceptual. Here is one of many experiments that suggest that. Um, this is uh, an experiment done on 12-month-old uh, babies, 
And so there's a screen. They're looking at the screen. An object comes out one side. A different colored object comes out the other side. Then the screen goes down. And the, uh, the babies do not expect two things. Okay, So they don't register color. It's an interesting thing about color in babies. But um, uh, their, their, their color vision is fine. At four to six months, they, can, um, uh, they have all the basic color discriminations. If anybody's interested, I can explain how they tell that. Um, but um, uh, uh, they do not use color in reasoning uh, between about four to six months and starting maybe a little like, like 12 to 18 months, they start using color in reasoning. So their, non, their, their appreciation of color is non-conceptual. Um, so yeah, this is what I just said. OK, I am going to have to skip. OK, so here is a, a little kind of brain illustration of some of the ideas that are at issue here. Um, so um, this is the back of the head where vision starts. You know, the uh, uh, light comes in your eyes. It um, um, uh, is uh, the signals are sent through ret retina to the something in the middle of your brain, the lateral geniculus, nucleus, and they go to the first um, cortical visual areas in the back of your head. Um, and uh, the my my um, opponents. So sorry. These arrows are, indicate attention. This means that the person is attending to the stimulus. The arrow pointing to the back of the head where vision starts is attention to the stimulus. So this is a, um, um, an uh, a, a diagram of a brain when somebody is uncontroversially conscious of a stimulus. The person is attending to it. There are all these. Um, uh, um, uh, reciprocal connections, um, reciprocal activations going into frontal cortex. The key here is frontal cortex. That's where thought, reasoning, decision making live in the brain. And my opponents think, the people who think all consciousness is access consciousness, that it's, the, the, it's that triggering the activation. It's called ignition that makes the, the in, uh, um, and, uh, that creates these, these neural correlations with frontal cortex that are um, the key to uh, uh, consciousness. Um, here is a, an undeniably unconscious perception. No, there's something called priming. If you get a, a stimulus, it affects your later uh, recognition. So for example, um, if, I get, if I have an unconscious subliminal presentation of the word doctor, I'll be quicker to recognize the word nurse as a word um, if, uh, if I've seen it. Here is the controversial case, which my opponent, Stanislav Stahan, um, uh, calls preconscious. And that is where you have attention away from the stimulus. You get strong loops in the back of the head, but no reportability unless attention shifts. So he thinks that's um, uh, not conscious. I say that it's probably conscious. So I'm now going to move to, maybe I should just quickly explain the global workspace. OK, so this is a diagram from um, uh, Stanislav Stahan, um, who is a, a French cognitive neuroscientist. And the idea is that these, the outer circle is the periphery of your body. These uh, 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 nodes are, are neural systems. The links are, um, uh, syst uh, are links between neural systems. The filled-in ones are active. Um, so here's his idea. The idea is that you have a um, uh, you have the, the sensory surface produces a lot of activations. There is a competition among them. Some of them form active coalitions, and then they trigger ignition into the frontal lobes. Um, when, th when, the, when the ignition in the frontal lobes makes the, um, uh, the stimuli conceptualized. So I've been talking a lot about the difference between unconceptualized and conceptualized. This is a, 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 um, 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 a, th a theory of what it is to be conceptualized. Um, OK, so here's the, I'm just going to quickly get to the methodological breakthroughs. And I think I'll only probably be able to do one of them. So my two hypotheses here are that conceptualize the stimulus requires global broadcasting. 
This is called global broadcasting, when these active coalitions trigger representations in the front. Um, hypothesis two is that non-conceptual conscious percepts do not require global broadcasting. So now a method here that I could use. OK, maybe I will do this. So this requires red and green, green glasses, which I happen to have brought with me. Actually, there's no time to pass it out. You know, I'm going to pass these out anyway, and then I can come back to it. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. So please don't touch the red and the green. Um, and then I'd like to have those back at the end. So until those are all passed out, which is going to be a while, I'm just going to, I'm going to go on. So if you look at this through red and green glasses, what, here's what you get. You get first a face, then a house, then a face. Fills your whole visual field. Okay? It's called binocular rivalry. There's, uh, um, you have incompatible representations, and, and the, the processing streams involving both the two eyes duke it out. Um, and interestingly, you can, uh, um, this is a terrific thing for studying consciousness because you have an unchanging input with changing conscious percept. Um, so, uh, and that's allowed people to identify some areas that are more active when you're conscious, like the fusiform face area of a face, and other areas that are active, more active when you're conscious of, say, a, a house. These things have, um, um, if you ask people to report whether they see a face or a house, what you get is frontal and parietal links being the key thing here. And that, that has been taken to support the global workspace idea. Um, however, um, eye movements can be validated as a measure of consciousness. So the key here, this is what's called a, a no-report method. So here's the problem. Reports are an index of phenomenal consciousness. You know, if you say you saw it, probably you did see it. They're also an index of access consciousness. How can you use reports to distinguish between phenomenal consciousness and access consciousness? It seems impossible. People have said it's impossible. However, whenever people say something is impossible, it's a dangerous thing because clever experimenters can find a way to make it possible. And that's happened here. So in an article um, uh, from um, uh, Wolfgang Einhauser's uh, group in, in 2014. By the way, I should say that the experiments, to the extent that I'm going to get a chance to go through these experiments, are all are very recent experiments. This is an area that is exploding in what people are finding out. And my approach to the hard problem is, um, you know, nobody can think of an answer to the hard problem, um, but that may be because of a failure of imagination. And the way to sort of you know, um, uh, juice up your imagination is to figure out how the easy problem works, how these states affect other states. And maybe by doing that, we'll be able to solve the hard problem. Anyway, so what Einhauser's lab um, found was that if, oh, so does everybody have the, uh, the, the, the red and glasses? Oh, whatever happened to them? Oh. oh, I'm sorry. What? What? They're all distributed. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, OK. So look, I'm just going to show you this, those of you who have them. I just want to make sure people see. I, I'm, it takes a little while, so you may. What you should be seeing, if this is working properly, is alternating house face, house face. Unless you have a very, very dominant eye. How many are seeing that? Yeah. Raise your hand if you're seeing the alternation. OK. Oh, good. OK. I'm sorry I didn't bring enough. OK, so I'm going to go back to this thing. OK, so all right. so. If you do the binocular rivalry with a grid moving one way in one eye and a grid moving the other way in the other eye, turns out there's a nice index of what you are conscious of. And that index is called optokinetic nystagmus. And this is what the eye does. The eye movements indicate which thing you are conscious of. 
And it can be shown using people's reports that they correlate pretty well. But now there's this cool thing. You've got a, uh, an index uh, of what people are experiencing. And now you can show them the original stimuli and don't ask them to report, OK? No report paradigm. OK, so here's what is found out. Um, so here's a quotation from the article. Importantly, when observers passively experienced rivalry without reporting perceptual alternations, a different picture, that is a different picture from the global workspace idea, emerged. Um, a differential neural activity in frontal areas was absent, whereas activation in the back of the head and the middle of the head persisted. We conclude that frontal areas are associated with active report and introspection. OK, so contradicting some of these earlier things. Now, I have a lot more on this experiment, which I'm not going to go into. Uh, but uh, you know, I was very pleased to see this uh, because, of course, it backs up my view. <laughs> what I'm, as you know, Eric and I talked at lunch about, I, of course, I'm very most what I'm most interested in is finding, you know, is, is getting a, 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 a leg up on the truth. But I have an independent interest in seeing my own views confirmed. Um, and this did it. Um, and quite a lot of these experiments have actually con uh, uh, confirmed, confirmed uh, my picture of this, which uh, I've been pushing for a really long time. So let me quickly switch to a different one. So I'm, this, this longer talk involves three different uh, techniques for avoiding the problem. But let me just explain the problem I'm trying to avoid. The problem is both views, me, this is mine, this is my opponent's, both of them end up with sparse cognition. So it seems that the basis of theorizing in reports is going to be the same in either case. So that's the puzzle. And then the one I just showed you is a way around it. It's called no report. But of course, reports have got to be in there somewhere. In the case I just showed you, the reports come before the experiment. The one I'm going to show you now, the reports come after the experiment. And I'll just do this very briefly. Um, this uses. Um, um, something called event-related potential, which is a, um, a, a form of EEG. And then the idea here is, this is my, my opponent, uh, Stanislaus Dehaene, one of my many opponents. Um, I'll just, I won't explain this whole diagram, but the idea here is this looks at the difference between seen things and unseen things. He means consciously seen and not consciously seen. And you only start to get a separation at about 270 milliseconds to 300 milliseconds. So you can use temporal differences to get at whether it's a conscious perception or not on, on the global workspace point of view. So here's the technique. This is work done by Michael Pitts um, at Reed College. Um, so the paradigm is this. You have a ring. Uh, with these disks in it. And the task is to detect uh, a, a disk being a dimming. Okay? And, and that focuses your attention on the periphery of the screen, right? because it's a very difficult task. He, he calibrates it to be extremely difficult. Um, in the meanwhile, while the, that's going on, there's constantly changing lines in the middle. Um, uh, so here's a, 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 an example of a square that occurs in the middle. Um, and he's, he set this up so that only about half the subjects notice it. So what he does here is the, uh, the first stage, which is probably the, the most significant one, is uh, he does 240 trials of this dimming detecting thing, um, and then asks people afterwards whether they saw a figure. Um, and what he finds is that if they, the, uh, he does a long, detailed questionnaire. He shows them various possible examples of what the figure might have been. And so he's, he's trying really hard to rule out guessing and other things. Um, so what he finds is that conscious experience correlates with uh, um, activations earlier than the global workspace. 
at about maybe 200 to 250 milliseconds. So it's this temporal difference. So again, this supports my view. And I'll, I'll just uh, um, uh, quote some of the what he, what he says here. I won't show you the whole experiment. Um, but here's what he says. He says, the pattern results suggest that the neural events reflected in, and this is this ND1, ND2 is this stuff right here, um, may be adequate in themselves to produce visual awareness, whereas more widespread activity indexed in these things, which occurs at 400 to 600 milliseconds, might be required only when the stimuli need to be processed further to fulfill the goals of the task at hand. This distinction parallels that made by previous theorists between phenomenal consciousness and access consciousness. So this is the first of, his, of many experiments that supports this point of view. And I won't go into all the details, but he, he, what he shows in, the, in this work is that um, it's re reporting. It's the cognitive processes uh, underlying reporting and, and conceptualizing that lead uh, uh, to global workspace activation. And uh, OK. Um, so, um, so according to this is a 2014 book by one of my opponents, Stanislaus Dehaan, who says, when the prefrontal cortex does not gain access to a message, it cannot be broadly shared and therefore remains unconscious. What I think is that that's unconceptualized, but in many cases conscious. So just to sum up, um, the evidence for rich conscious perception um, uh, stems from these delayed indicators uh, from eye movements. And I didn't get a chance to do the ones about gist judgments. And so the idea is that uh, um, the um, well, I haven't really justified this, but anyway, the, the thought is that um, um, uh, phenomenal consciousness probably is not as informational a kind of thing as uh, access consciousness. That, and uh, so I think um, is likely to resist um, uh, computer approaches. And I'm just going to stop. So questions, and they would like you to use the, the microphone. Maybe somebody can hand the microphone around. Sorry, there's a little quick kind of run through some of some stuff. OK, thanks. Um, I have a question. With, um, with the, the trials that you'd mentioned, um, I wonder if you see differences. How do I ask this? So, the, the trials seem to assume that people are always the same, but like some like I'm kind of tired right now. Like it's Monday, yeah. so maybe the way that I would, um, you know, perform with a given trial now, if I'm yeah. hungry, if I'm not hungry, like how yeah. do, how does that like the reality of like the body and yeah. outside forces yeah. influence or not influence the consciousness trial? Yeah. Okay. So it, in all experiments, that's a problem. There's going to be a lot of variance. You know, it's just treated as noise, really. It's ways in which the, you will not get uniformity of response uh, because of variation and all kinds of things to do with people. Um, and uh, there, you, know, you just have to deal with the noise and the data. But it is a, it is a persistent problem. Hi. Um, I wonder, back to the, the title, uh, so I wonder why, can you summarize why the artificial intelligence approach won't work for the explanation of consciousness or what? Yeah, the thought, well, I didn't really get into this, uh, um, uh, but the thought behind it is that um, that our, the artificial intelligence approaches are probably better for access consciousness than phenomenal consciousness. This idea of global broadcasting um, seems more um, amenable. You know, it's information flow, basically, whereas what's going on in phenomenal consciousness seems somehow different from information flow. It seems maybe to involve you know, biochemical mechanisms in the brain. I mean, we don't know what the nature of phenomenal consciousness is. So I guess maybe what I should really say is there is a possibility that um, information methods based on the flow of information won't work for phenomenal consciousness. It is certainly true that advances to do with phenomenal consciousness seem to be coming from neuroscience rather than from computer science or artificial intelligence. You know, one of the hopes, I mean, one of the points that people have made about the global workspace viewpoint, the one I've been arguing against, is that it's in principle implementable on a machine. So people who are interested in machine consciousness have been very happy 
with the global workspace idea. So to the extent that I'm arguing against the global workspace idea, I'm arguing against uh, at least a standard kind of computer approach to consciousness. In your mind, can you imagine, or is it, do you believe that machines can get consciousness? Yeah, I think in the, look, I think we're conscious machines. So, I'm, you know, we're meat machines. I, I, I'm, I'm not any kind of a dualist or anything like that. Um, but I think that um, the most obvious application of theoretical approaches um, to consciousness from a machine point of view haven't panned out. Um, I'm, I haven't mentioned really there's a lot of other more machine-friendly approaches. So I'm... You know, some of them may look. Depends what kind of machine we're talking about. I, my f uh, feeling is that we may need some kind of analog processes to deal with consciousness. But you know, this is initial stages of uh, approach to it. So I'm not entirely sure how to ask this question. So bear with me. But it, it seemed like a lot of the things you were examining in terms of what constituted, you know, conscious awareness of information or conceptualization of information or uh, you know, unconscious or preconscious conceptualization of information or recognition of information, all kind of had to do with a sense that there's sort of like like one place like where consciousness is happening, like consciousness is all kind of one singular like sort of Cartesian process. And like if that's not true, what implication would that have for these questions? You know, is it possible that these might all be irrelevant questions to consciousness overall and are merely a question of where information happens to be in the brain at any given point? Yeah, so I definitely do not think there is a place in the brain. My, one of my opponents, Daniel Dennett, has used that to caricature my position. He calls it the Cartesian theater. Um, so I think that our best guess about like where in the brain consciousness happens is that every conscious content is processed by the area that processes that kind of information. So for example, <laughs> Um, conscious um, uh, contents of um, motion have to do with uh, activations in that area MT. Probably they involve um, um, uh, reciprocal connections to lower visual areas. Conscious um, uh, appreciation of faces probably has to do with activation in this thing called the fusiform face area at the bottom of your right temporal lobe. So. I don't think there's any place where they come together. The closest thing to a place, I like to distinguish between what makes a content, um, uh, between uh, um, the difference between different conscious contents like face and, and motion. I like to distinguish that question from what makes those contents conscious, a matter that has been explored by studying, for example, anesthesia. And it looks like there's some kind of general connectivity, especially going back to this thing in the middle of the brain called the thalamus. People used to th speak of a thalamic switch. So the closest thing to like a place where it all happens might be that. But I don't think that's what explains the dif difference between consciousness of a face and consciousness of motion. It's more like a, a kind of an, a, you know, something in the direction of an on-off switch. Maybe a silly question, but I noticed all of your examples in this were done with people. Yeah. What about animals? Like. Yeah. Okay, so there was a big revolution in the study of consciousness in the mid-1990s when um, uh, uh, Francis Crick, the Nobel Prize winning biologist, and Christoph Koch realized you could approach consciousness through studying animals. And a lot of the work is with animals. Uh, you know, it happened that, uh, uh, actually, I skipped something that was about the involved subjects were monkeys. But a lot of the work is in animals. And uh, I think there's every reason to believe that our primate cousins um, are just as conscious as we are. Um, uh, you know, it used to be, before about 20 years ago, that people thought of consciousness in terms of language. And I think that access consciousness was, you know, what they had in mind. And I think one of the things that's happened in the last 20 years is people have realized that language really doesn't have much to do with it. So yeah, there's a lot of work on consciousness with animals. Of course, it's easier to get reports from people. So, um, But there's been really some surprising work with animals where um, you can really get at what, they, uh, um, uh, you know, what, what they're experiencing through nonverbal methods. OK, thank you. 
Um, if you suppose we had a synapse level uh, simulation of the full human brain, which yeah. I'd argue we might just be 15 years away from or so, um, would this simulation exhibit phenomenal consciousness? Uh, well, that's something that people have uh, argued about. So one common point is that a simulation of a rainstorm isn't wet. And maybe a simulation of a conscious being isn't conscious either. So this all goes back to the issue, which we don't know about, but which could be true, that consciousness essentially involves something to do with the neural processes that are going on in the brain, some kind of analog thing. Um, and that uh, without an analog device of that, that sort, you're not going to get conscious. For example, um, uh, signals in neurons are electrical, but the neurons uh, communicate via chemicals that go across the synapse. Maybe that's part of what's needed for consciousness. Maybe if you don't have, you, maybe you could make an artificial synapse. Well, people have made artificial synapses, but you, maybe you'd have to use uh, neurotransmitters for it to really have genuine consciousness. This is the thing. We don't really know what at its most basic level consciousness is, so we don't know the answer to that. Um, follow up uh, to that, to not knowing what consciousness is. Um, what attempts have been made to attack this question from the point of, instead of asking what is consciousness, asking why is consciousness, and yeah. speculating why it evolved even? Yeah. Okay, well, a lot of people have, have, have tried to, you know, to, to answer that. Of course, it's a little hard to know. If, you know look, evol evolutionary reasoning, you know, there's, it's famous for the so-called you know, just so stories, uh, in, uh, to use uh, Stephen Jay Gould's phrase. Um, but there are, there are all sorts of hypotheses um, about you know, why we have consciousness. It's obviously doing something for us. You know, um, whether, no, here are some possibilities. Maybe it's motivational. So you know, positive consciousness, pleasure, pain. Maybe it is, um, some, it's a way of organizing attention or uh, has something to do with interactions with attention. Um, so they're all, there's no shortage of speculations, but you know, it's, I don't think anybody knows. Um, could you describe again, the, the, I, I, I was a bit confused, the difference between uh, um, kind of conscious perception and uh, conscious perception that is not conceptualized, which is basically the thing where and also, once you do that, uh, discuss a bit kind of the consequences, like what, what would that mean yeah. if one theory is two versus the other? OK, so a good um, uh, index of this is the uh, uh, baby's perception of color. OK, so you've got this six-month-old baby. Its color discriminations are uh, almost at the level of, a, uh, of an adult. Um, and the way you can tell that, for example, is if you have a, 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 um, a, a colored background and a, a, a different colored disc, a baby looking at that or an, and an adult looking at that will tend to move their eyes to the disc if they can see the difference. So that is an, gives you, an, that's one method. There's a number of methods of finding this out. That's one method that tells you that babies distinguish between colors pretty much the way we do uh, after about six, four to six months. However, they cannot use colors in reasoning. So here's an example experiment. Um, if uh, babies are very interested in movement and noise, if you um, uh, and you can, uh, uh, they can. So you, uh, a display. This is uh, done by Jean Remy Hochmann. You have a display where a wonderful noisy puppet thing that twirls around will either occur on the left or the right. If you see two identical shapes, then you can set it up so that it's on the left. And the baby will notice that regularity. And two identical shapes, look at the left, because there's going to be something great there. What about two identical colors on the left? They can't do it. They can't. They don't register colors in a way that allows them to use them in reasoning. So, that's what concepts are about. They're about reasoning and thinking and decision making and evaluating. They just can't do it. So, um, and in fact, babies don't even learn the four basic color words until they're three years, three months old. 
Um, an experiment done by, Michael, by Mabel Rice in the 1980s took kids who did not know the difference between red and green, uh, did not, sorry, did not know the words for red and green and tried to teach them the words red and green. This is three-year-olds. She had to go through a thousand trials to get kids to to um, uh, learn the red green contrast. The typical thing is once they learn one color word, they learn them all, because you know there's there's been a lot of experimental work on this. But basically, what we're dealing with is a creature, namely the human baby, that does not r register color in a way that allows them to conceptualize it. It's non-conceptual. I think all perception is like that. It's that it's most fundamental level, it's non-conceptual. It, 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 sometimes they're automatically conceptualized when it gets into our conceptual system. But what you have to realize is the perceptual and the, and the cognitive are just different in the human brain. Now, maybe that doesn't have to be true in the machine brain, but you know, we would be wise to give a thought to how people work when we're thinking about how to get machines to work. So that's the, that's the reason it's relevant. Like one way or one thing that comes to mind here is maybe another terminology difference between these two things that might be useful is um, conceptual is sort of like symbolic reasoning, symbolic process yeah. processing like you would do in like logical formulae or something. Yeah. Whereas, like, the other type of processing that you're considering is more like, say, a digital signal processor that translates audio data to digital yeah. data. Mm -hmm. It's not doing symbolic reasoning there. It's doing, applying just some kind of fixed transformations. And yeah. that seems to be the site of phenomenal character in your view. Yeah. That then gets brought up into this sort of symbolic central unit. Yeah. That's, I, I, yeah, I accept that. Yeah, good. Are any of these points, do all, does all of this make sense still if you are a dualist? Ah, OK. Yeah. Um, I think everything I've said could be accepted by a dualist. Um, maybe, um, well, maybe not. Ex you know, I did say some things that sounded like I think there's a neural basis. But even dualists can accept a neural basis for conscious experience. So yeah, I think everything I said could be, could be thought of could be accepted by a dualist. So the question is whether that neural basis is really all there is to it or not. OK. Thank you. That's, uh, that's it for questions. And let's thank Ned again. Thank you.